and we're now moving into the next session on equine health and I'm delighted that first up we've got David Mountford who is uh, chair of the British Horse Council as well as other things so David over to you Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to attend and speak to you today. Um, I've been asked to speak about the equine health and welfare pathway, or the animal health and welfare pathway, how horses might fit into that equation, talk a little bit about infectious disease in that context and how we might pr protect against it, uh, and also to finish with some comments on legislative changes. So the animal health and welfare pathway. What is it? Well, it's, at its very heart, it's a collaboration between government and the industry to enhance animal welfare, to in, improve animal health, and alongside that, to improve trade and the environment. At the moment, it applies solely in England, although the devolved administrations are developing their own equivalents as we go forward. Uh, and in the UK, sorry, and in England, it's focusing in its initial phase on farmed cattle, farmed sheep, <coughs> pigs, and chickens. And the, for those sectors, it'll be rolling out this year. And for those sectors, it'll be looking at um, a number of things. Firstly, a welfare and health review carried out by the farmer's vet alongside the farmer to identify improvements that can be made. On the back of that, to develop co-funding for capital grants for the funders to improve the health and welfare being offered on their premises. For the specific species, it's looking at disease protection and eradication programs being developed and being supported. And finally, and in time, there is a potential for payment by results. So as a farmer, if you're providing excellent health and welfare for your animals or for the animals under your care, then there's the opportunity for you to get some support from the government for doing so. So that's for the, the general sector. But what about the horse sector? Where do we fit into that? Well, the British Horse Council, we've been putting together some basic ideas for a strategy for the whole of the industry. And very neatly, the health and the welfare aspects of that strategy overlap perfectly and com will combine with the equine side of the health and welfare pathway that government is starting to develop at the moment. So we're very lucky in that we have this ongoing great relationship with DEFRA, which um, is enabling their team associated with the pathway and our council to start work on that uh, over the last month and going forward to make sure that we have something that is fit for our sector for the future. And it doesn't necessarily need to follow the same line as the other um, animal sectors have. So what we've done to date, and this is just in the health side of things, um, is we've tried to break things down into manageable little chunks to give ourselves specific goals in specific areas that we might look at be they antimicrobial resistance, antiomintic resistance, which David's talking about later on, or be they ID and traceability. We've identified our target outcomes, and we've tried to give ourselves a score, a mark out of 10, if you like, for how we think we're doing at the moment, and also reflect a little bit on whether we think the situation in that particular area is improving, deteriorating, or whether it's staying the same. By making those very basic assessments at the top level, we're, we should be able to hone in on those areas where we can make most difference and we can benefit most horses from the health and the welfare side of things. So, again, focusing in on protection against infectious disease. So leaving aside all the other aspects of health, injuries, care, etc., for the purpose of this talk, what can we do to protect against disease? Well, we can minim minimise our chances of con coming into contact with the disease. When we are in contact, we can minimise the chances of the disease taking hold. And then finally, um, we can minimise the opportunities for that disease to spread across the herd. But we can't do that in isolation. We're not looking at a, a, a bubble here. We can't keep every horse wrapped in cotton wool, staying at home, no, not contacting, no risk of disease. So we need to do that in the constraints of avoiding disruption to sport, avoiding disruption to the leisure horse market, and avoiding disruption to the industry and the trade that we all rely on. So if we take those one by one, if we start off by looking at the, minimum, at the chances of contacting the disease, we can obviously do big things. We can eradicate disease. Um, and there's some great ambitions there. And we can look at involving the pathway and supporting that. 
but we need to be realistic as to what's feasible. We can also look at the pathway and go our work with government to help us with import controls. And if we look at diseases like EVA, where in recent years the only, chance, the only times it's been seen in the UK is on the back or inside um, stallions that have been imported predominantly from the rest of Europe. Or if we look at um, equine influenza, the 2019 outbreak, many of the outbreaks in, the, in England were traceable back to <coughs> unvaccinated horses that had been imported from elsewhere. So what's to say as part of this pathway we can't ex agree with government that we should be making sure that every stallion that comes into this country is checked for EVA before it arrives. Or even that we ask that every adult horse that's imported into this country is vaccinated against equine influenza before it enters. So we can do those sort of things at the top level, but also at the more local level, we can do our own work to improve biosecurity, both at competition and on livery yards and on other premises where horses are kept. There are certain challenges in doing that, and at the end of the day, we probably rely on voluntary good practice in order to make that work. But this pathway potentially gives us the opportunity to find new and novel ways of incentivising best practice amongst horse owners around the country. What about minimising the chances of, of catching an infection? Well, we can do the very basic things. We know where the risks are. If a new horse is on the yard, we know that we should be increasing our biosecurity levels. We should be testing temp taking temperatures more regularly, looking out for general health indicators more regularly. Uh, we know that we should be using isolation procedures and premises where we can. Um, we also know over the last couple of years, especially, that vaccination provides a critical route for us uh, that we can take advantage of. We've come to learn all sorts of things about vaccines. We know that they have great strengths, but we know that they're not perfect. We know that they don't apply, one rule doesn't apply to everyone, that in some circumstances uh, and with some individuals we might wish to take a different approach to vaccination than for others. We understand that viruses mutate and that vaccines have different efficacy against different strains of viruses. And we've also managed as a nation to get our head around the concept of herd immunity, something probably many of us hadn't heard of two years ago. And herd immunity is fundamental if we're planning on any eradication program or any serious control measure for, uh, for diseases that can be vaccinated against. But as I mentioned before, it's all tricky to be able to achieve that in practice, particularly at places like grassroots competitions. So can we turn to technology to find new ways of addressing those problems, i.e. with vaccinations? And the answer is yes, and that's already happening. So the FEI has its horse app, which now has a vaccination element to it, which is currently being trialled by a number of beaver vets across the country, some of whom are here today. Uh, and Weatherbiz, for a couple of years now, has had its own vaccination app, which means that no horse, no race horse, can enter a race in the UK without, its, without digital proof that its vaccinations are up to date. I think to have pressed the button too quickly. If I go back one. Thank you. Um, so there are things that we can do to it protect ourselves against catching the disease, what about minimising the chances of it spreading? Fundamentally, that comes down to us being prepared. We need a plan and we need available guidance so that when the inevitable happens and an infectious disease occurs, we are ready for it and we know how to deal with it. And we're really lucky in this country that we've got some of the world's top experts in this field, one of whom is following me onto the stage. Richard and his team at Cambridge um, are, provide the R industry with the most amazing resource, which he'll tell you a little bit about. Um, but we must make sure that as an industry, we support it in its entirety as a whole. We shouldn't just rely on the racing sector to fund that work. It applies equally to all of us. And Richard will also mention Professor Celia Marr's work with, the BE, uh, with BEF in order to prepare, uh, prepare event organisers for the outbreak of infectious disease. So that's at that level, but there's also the track and trace side of things. There's the ID and the premises registration that the Minister has already mentioned this morning. And we know that track and trace didn't work perfectly in, in the COVID outbreak, but we also know that in our heart of hearts, humans are pretty tricky to control, and horses, whilst they're difficult to handle, are easier to manage their movements. So, new ID legislation is being, is being introduced, um, and we're really grateful for that, and it will look at 
um, new premises registration as well, which is critically important. That gives us the opportunity to move the whole programme forward. It will enable people to more readily and easily address the challenges of updating their data and give us a really accurate idea of how many horses we've got, where they are, and who owns them. That situation is, is very exciting, and it's something many of us in the British Horse Council have been working for for nine years now, since the 2013 horse meat scandal. Uh, and importantly, it's now going out to all the stakeholders in the world, as, oh, sorry, in the world, in England. As the Minister has already said, um, a consultation is being put together by DEFRA, which will be launched very soon. Um, the British Horse Council is also putting together a short uh, survey which will be going out to accompany that, and we've been working with DEFRA um, on that, which means that every horse owner, every equine stakeholder will have the opportunity to feedback either through the simple and short survey that the BHC have put out or will be putting out or through the more detailed uh, consultation that DEFRA is offering up. And we'd encourage everybody to partake in that and to make sure that all your colleagues, friends and your own members take, take part in that. Fundamentally, it's something, as I've already indicated, that the British Horse Council Board is hugely supportive of. We see a simple, digital, uh, free and easy to use system to be halfway to the answer of getting all our horses registered, or, as the Minister said, almost all of our horses registered, and having some idea of where they sit so that we can act in a positive way. It's clear, um, listening to the speakers this morning, that things are progressing in other nations as well. And we look to the Irish uh, to see what they're doing and how well it's worked for them and things that we can learn from that. But we must get on the, the bandwagon if we are to move forward. We know that other countries are moving forward with registration of premises, with digital identification. Uh, and if we want to maintain our seat at the top table of equestrianism, then we need to be on that group with them. We're lucky in England that we're moving forward with that, and we've got a very supportive minister and DEFRA team that are driving that forward. Um, in Northern Ireland and in Scotland and in Wales, things aren't quite so far forward, but I know that there is a desire to look at these things, and I know that there is a will to move things forward. And I would encourage all the stakeholders who are from those proud nations to exert more and more pressure on their administrations to ensure that the rest of the United Kingdom comes with us in England. We want to make sure that all of the horses in the UK have their health and welfare prioritised. And we know that if we do that, we will enable a strong industry and a strong trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. We'll take questions after we've heard from both Richard Newton and Beth Wells. So, Richard, welcome. You've been a... a, a participant uh, at these conferences in the past. Delighted to see you again. Slightly new hat, but still very important stuff. Yes, Please uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr Chairman, uh, Your Royal Highness, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. I was last here two years ago. At that time, I was under the banner of the Animal Health Trust, uh, but things have changed, as we've seen, on many fronts. And unfortunately, the Animal Health Trust didn't survive uh, COVID was one of its victims and closed at the end of July 2020. But we were very lucky in that we were uh, recruited by the British Horse Racing o Authority uh, under their auspices, funded by the Horse Race Betting Levy Board. And since November uh, of last year, we've been based at the vet school in Cambridge. That seems to be working very well. We've been made to work, feel very welcome indeed. And that's allowed us to establish our systems again. We've got a dedicated website. We try and provide uh, helpline to veterinary surgeons out there that are looking for assistance in control of infectious disease. And as you scroll through this website, you'll see a number of our initiatives that we've, uh, that we've resurrected and we're continuing to uh, deliver. And I'll touch on a few of these uh, as, as we go through. But this is just to give you uh, an idea of what's on that website and what you can find out if you go and scroll through it. So one of those is our working closely with DEFRA APHA. You'll also see the devolved uh, government uh, veterinary uh, parties are up there as well and this is the surveillance reports for all of the UK. We're now maintaining that historical archive of all the reports going back to uh, 2005 
And I would just direct you to a report that we produced in 2021, in the second quarter. And what you may recall then, well, that was a time when a disease called um, equine herpes virus myeloencephalopathy was causing problems in mainland Europe, in the Iberian Peninsula in particular. We were working closely with the FEI at the time, and we're very lucky that their veterinary department produced for us quite a detailed description of what they were encountering and how they were dealing with that particular problem. As often happens with these focus articles, we have a good relationship with the veterinary record and they reproduce this article for wider dissemination. And hopefully that's uh, something that you can track down and it's a really good description of what's going on. So I was invited to join this uh, veterinary epidemiology working group with other uh, like-minded scientists um, uh, dotted elsewhere in, in Europe, including uh, Ireland. And we worked with the FEI to sort of provide an oversight in how this outbreak was, was controlled. And I'm very pleased to say that the, the work of all of this is coming to fruition now in that there will be three reports looking into uh, the effects and impacts of, of this particular outbreak. Whilst we didn't have a uh, disease caused by this outbreak in, in the UK, we were very mindful working with British Equestrian that we had to get horses back safely into this country that were out there comp competing on the show jumping circuit in Europe. So as David said, we were working as part of a group that Professor Celia Marr put together called the Equine Infectious Disease Advisory Group, and they convened to create a protocol in order to bring these horses safely back. And that involved quarantine. There were two options. There was a slow track where animals were going to quarantine for four weeks. They'd be monitored clinically, and then only testing conducted if they developed clinical signs. There was a fast track, a shorter quarantine, and this had the insurance of laboratory testing as well as clinical monitoring in order to ensure that there wasn't infectious disease uh, present in, in those animals. And that could be conducted 10 days apart. We worked closely with Rossdales. Some of our laboratory technicians that we'd had at the Animal Health Trust were now based there, so we had the expertise to provide the range of tests that we required. Uh, Rossdales put together this bespoke submission form so that we knew what samples were coming in were from this type of animal. And what I can say is that between the 4th of March and 17th of May, 195 animals were screened on the fast track uh, testing protocol, and those were amongst 34 batches, so 34 different groups of animals coming back into the UK. I'm pleased to say that the vast majority of those were negative, but I think this highlights that it probably was worthwhile that we did this, in that we did have two batches that each had an individual horse that was shown to be infected with EHV, but when we looked at the data, these were single horses only, they had low viral loads, there was no clinical evidence of disease, and importantly, no evidence of spread. So we got those animals back safely and we got them through that quarantine period. And this is the plug really for why this group was put together. It actually goes back to the flu outbreak in 2019, and that was to put together a set of advisory notes for member bodies of the BEF, and also the organizers of equine gatherings in order to raise the bar in terms of biosecurity of how these events uh, are, are run. And I'm pleased to say that in September this initiative was launched and we really hope that it will be taken up as, as we go forward and that the biosecurity will be uh, improved. So what's been going on in the UK in 2021, hence my title? Well, for this, let's go to the International Collating Centre. This is an interactive website that we maintain. And from this, we can look at the uh, set dates. And this was in, in 20. Uh, 2021 through to a period of, of quite recently. And if you look at that in detail, you'll see that we've had CEM diagnosed twice, we've had flu diagnosed again, and a series of herpes virus infections as well. So touching on CEM, again, looking at the, you can vary these dates, you can look at different countries, but if we do this for the UK, you'll see that we've got two outbreaks. One of these uh, back in uh, June of last year, uh, was in Devon, and then more recently in February, we've had another incident in, in Gloucestershire. What ties these together is the fact that these are subclinical animals, so they're not showing any clinical signs. They were both imported from mainland Europe sometime before they were detected. Um, and the other important thing is that by working with DEFRA, we established an industry-led protocol that we lead on, and through that, and this is outlined in, in the Levy Board Codes of Practice, we're able to work closely uh, with appointed official veterinarians in order to 
take the samples and get these animals uh, cleared and, and through. And we're, we're hopefully close to achieving all of that for, this, uh, for these incidents. Just moving on to flu, again, one of the platforms that we deliver is called EquiFluNet, and this aims to monitor the ongoing situation with flu, not only in the UK, but globally. And this was brought in on the back of or during uh, the epidemic in uh, 2019. So on that, you can set the dates and look what's going on. So on your left there, you'll see the density map. We've seen flu in the period since the beginning of 2019 across wide tracts of the UK. You'll see on the right the outbreak curve, the very clear evidence of two waves in 2019 that caused so much disruption. Then went quiet, 2020, impact of COVID, not much flu diagnosed, but then it started to pick up. And there you can see on the right, we started to see some activity at the end of last year. If we look at that in a little bit more detail, again, quite wide ranging across the UK where it's occurring. There were 30 diagnoses made uh, last year, but more than 50%. So 16 out of the 30 <coughs> appeared in the last two months of, of the year. That started to raise alarm bells again, and we issued uh, an update out into the industry and, and to veterinary stakeholders to warn their clients. Uh, and, and that was uh, done after we'd obviously moved to, um, uh, we'd, we'd moved to um, Cambridge. And also, if you go to our latest report for the last quarter of uh, last year, uh, this is outlined in, in that DEFRA report, which you can access off, off the website. And finally, just a plug here for the levy board, the horse race betting levy, levy board, we managed to resurrect uh, their funding of, of, of a testing scheme that veterinary practices can enrol on. And we've got a page on our website where they can do that. And we are monitoring the coverage that we're managing to get from that scheme. We've got 53 practices enrolled so far and quite a wide uh, coverage of, the G, of, uh, of, of GB there. Although we are looking for practices to cover North and Mid Wales and some coverage up in North East Scotland. Well, I'm not quite sure how many horses we've, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've got up there compared to the rest of the UK. And then finally, just looking at West Nile virus, this is something we're keeping an eye on. This is actually from 2020. These are both human, bird, and horse cases produced by uh, this uh, group in, in Europe. We draw that line across there. This was quite worrying. We had disease appearing uh, in Germany and that had been there since 2018. In 2020, it was starting to appear in the Netherlands and often it will appear in humans and birds before it gets into horses, so this was quite worrying. But luckily, if we look at our own data from 2021, whilst West Nile was reported from many of the uh, Mediterranean uh, bordering countries, but also Germany, very pleased to say that the Netherlands um, has still not reported any West Nile virus cases. But I don't think we could be complacent, because I'll just highlight this little bit of work, nothing to do with horses, but it's some surveillance done in wild birds, and they managed to demonstrate the presence of Usutu virus, which is a similar virus to West Nile, the same family. It's already known to be present in countries like the Netherlands, so it highlights that we have to be vigilant that this uh, uh, disease that can affect horses, West Nile, could be on its way, and, and this is evidence that, that that could be the case. So finally, in summing up, um, we were uh, retained by the thoroughbred industry, and, and for that we're very, very grateful, and now obviously we're based at Cambridge. I think 2021 clearly highlighted that equine infectious diseases are still a threat. And they're posed through various different pathways, whether they be horse movements, importation without appropriate screening, as we saw with CEM. We've got mixing at events, as we saw with Valencia and other events in, in, in Spain. And also we need to be vigilant to vector-borne disease, such as the mosquito-borne West Nile virus and, and Usutu virus. Also, We've seen that the codes of practice, new advisory guidance is coming in. These should be adopted wherever possible and they should be kept under review as well. And I do just want to say that we work closely with DEFRA and we really treasure that, that relationship that we have with our quarterly reports and also now with our CEM control. So my final slide really is just some hopes for the future. Obviously we want to continue what we're doing and we want to improve on it. And I think there are opportunities, and this could be quite a long list, and I'm not going to make it very long, but I think government and industry continue to work more closely together than we already do. And so looking at protocols for EVA, investigation and control, improving West Nile virus surveillance, thinking about that pre-import testing. Can we change that? Can we defer some of this uh, to uh, the other side of, uh, of the various seas that we, uh, that we border? 
I think there are great opportunities for the thoroughbred and non-thoroughbred sectors to be working much more closely together. And David's touched upon that. And just one example is some uh, strangle surveillance that we've been very fortunate to have the Horse Trust Fund and to develop for us, but it will need sustaining and keeping going. I think it's proving very valuable. And also just generally adopting surveillance, adopting the codes of practice, and adopting these biosecurity protocols goes for everybody who has a horse, whatever type it is. And finally, it's all down to resources, it's all down to money, it's all down to people, and we've heard a lot about that already. But I think there are things that we really could be investing in better. Syndromic surveillance, looking at associated pathogen discovery. There may be new syndromes out there that we don't know what's going on, and we need to be able to look at that. What I've called here molecular surveillance. We've heard all about this with COVID, the new uh, uh, isolates or, 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 or variants of interest. And we can only do that when we've got genome sequencing accompanying uh, uh, that, that work. And then finally, and you'll hear about that this afternoon, really important surveillance is antimicrobial and antelmintic resistance. And on that, I will just finally thank those from the, levy, uh, from the horse racing uh, breeding industry that have continued to support us. We're very grateful to that, and we look forward to new opportunities to keep our work going. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Richard. Th thank you very much, Minister. Um, we'll now move on to the final slot here about equine grass sickness, and I'm delighted that we've got Beth Wells from the Morden, who's going to introduce this section, uh, because we're going to then show a little video from BBC Scotland. So, Beth, welcome, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Your Royal Highness, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a real pleasure today to introduce to you our new equine grass sickness project. Now, what's new about that, you may say, we've known about the disease for 100 years. We still don't have any causal agents, but that's because it is a really complex and a multifactorial disease. So it's very, been very difficult to get a handle on this disease. What we do know is that the damage is caused by a neurotoxin, which affects the swallowing and gut motility of the horse. But now we need to find out where that neurotoxin is coming from. So at Morden, we're one year into a new research fellowship programme with the Equine Grass Sickness Fund. And we're using all of our newest technologies and a multidisciplinary approach to try and crack this problem. But to enable this, in the first year, we've had to set up what we call a national biobank of samples. And that is so the research is robust and it's strong. Um, and this, this um, biobank has been set up with generous funding from the British Horse Society, and we're, we're very grateful for that. It's critically important for the research. And, um, and why are we doing this research? Well, we're about to show you a short film clip from Landward. It's courtesy of BBC Scotland, which shows the effect of this devastating disease on a very well-known breeding stud. And the seeding, actually, of the ideas which has gone on um, to produce this new project. And while these animals enjoy the season's new growth of grass, this crop can bring dread for horse owners. Arlene visited Royal Deeside in April to find out about a fatal disease that's been scaring the equine community for years and the latest attempts to beat it. These Highland ponies are from the Balmoral Estate. Working animals bred here on the stud re-established by the Queen herself in 2007. But just because they have a very famous owner doesn't mean that they aren't susceptible to a very serious disease. Equine grass sickness is devastating, with an 80% mortality rate. It first emerged in Scotland in the early 1900s and has spread across Northern Europe. It's a distressing illness that affects the horse's ability to swallow. And with no clear cause or cure, it's had a huge impact on the breeding programme here at the Queen's Stud. Every morning you wake up and hope that you don't need to get the stethoscope out to listen for gut noise. Every day you just hope that everybody is going to survive through the night into the next day. Sylvia Ormerston is the manager here. She's seen what equine grass sickness can do. When did you first become aware of a problem here at Balmoral? It would have been on the 6th of June 2017 when we had a two-year-old filly 
who would normally be first at the gate and would come racing up for first attention, who quietly strolled to the gate, something not quite right. And within two days, uh, no eating, no drinking, no pooing, we realised that it was, that it was, you know, she was doomed basically, there was no return. So it's catastrophic, isn't They're it? dead on the inside. This was the start of a nightmare for Sylvia, with the stud losing two stallions within a fortnight of each other and five ponies in total. The Queen was actually here when we lost our second stallion and she was actually here to be able to say goodbye. The Queen is as passionate about the ponies as we are and takes it just as hard as we do. How does that impact on you personally? Because these are your babies. Yeah, yeah, you lose a lot of sleep over these people. You know, these little people are, are, are my kids. These are my family. It's a massive impact. The cause of the disease isn't clear, but grass seems to be the main risk factor. And it's thought that toxins from bacteria found on grazing land have something to do with it. But not all horses seem to be susceptible. When we lost our seven-year-old mare, she was in a field of 11 and she was the only one that contracted it. Um, the the two-year-old filly was in a field of five, yet she was the only one affected by it. So there are too many randoms, there are too many different things that could be causing it. And the Bulmoral Stud is now at the forefront of an ambitious five-year research plan by charity the Morden Institute to get to the bottom of what causes this cruel illness. Morden have launched a biobank to hopefully salvage any data that is taken from any individual animal who has passed away through the disease to be able to continue the research. Sylvia inadvertently kick-started the biobank when she pointed out to the Morden that valuable biological data was being lost because samples weren't taken from the dead horses. Now they will be. And presumably the more data they have... Yeah, the data is so important and what we mustn't do is lose that data. It has to get to the Morden, to the biobank. This is the whole point of setting up this biobank so we do not lose any data at all. And then hopefully there might be a piece of the jigsaw within that data to be able to give us a clue. It's important then that horse owners get involved with this. What can they do? Please give the information give the information from your animal who has deceased, who, your, your animal who, who is your pride and joy, but don't let it die in vain. Make sure that that data is collected. If this new work sheds light on the disease, it could lead to the discovery of a cause and a treatment being found. If not, Sylvia and other horse owners will continue to dread the coming of spring. The grass will come and then you know, we just, we, we panic every morning, we worry every morning about who's, who's next. Me, Sylvia says it all, um, and I know a lot of you will resonate with, with, with her, um, her sympathies. So where are we now? We, ha we have worked for the past year in setting up a huge UK network of vets and horse owners that have provided samples for the biobank. And we now have over a thousand pre and post mortem samples banked. But we do need many more of these, and particularly the post mortem samples, which are our gold standard. So awareness raising continues to be very important for us. But also, your data is throwing up some really interesting parallels and new ideas which we can take forward. The, the plans for the research to do with these samples are underway, and these samples are available, I should say, to all researchers um, that are looking into this disease. We built up a fantastic team of interdisciplinary scientists coming from all areas that we think are involved in the disease, and this is really important to get an overall view and to leave really no stones unturned. We need to fund these projects, of course, and somebody's already said this is a real issue for the equine industry, is getting funding, but we are working hard with industry to do this. We're very grateful for the support we've had already from the Morden Foundation, the Equine Grass Sickness Fund, the British Horse Society and World Horse Welfare, and to all the horse owners and vets who are already engaged. But we do hope that more of you will join us. We're very approachable. We welcome everybody. All the links you require are on the, the Grass Sickness website um, for you to, to find out about us. 
Um, so thank you very much for, for listening and I think by working together we will get the answers. Thank you.